Hello everyone, welcome back and in today's video we are going to take three problems from electrostatic section of Pathfinder. So we will begin with problem number 12 from the Billy Understanding section. So this problem essentially says that uh, we have a thin rigid insulating ring of radius r and mass m and it has a very small gap over here. If you guys can't see it, this is the gap that they are talking about. And the gap length is given to be L, whose dimensions are negligible in comparison to the radius of the ring. And it carries a uniformly distributed charge of Q. Basically, the charge per unit length of the ring lambda is Q divided by 2 pi r. So it's given that the ring is initially at rest in free space and a uniform electric field E is in the plane of the ring and parallel to the gap. So basically, this is the gap. It's given that the electric field is is in the direction of this gap length L. And now the electric field is switched on, then we have to figure out the maximum angular speed of the ring in the subsequent motion. So give this problem a try guys, then check out the solution. Okay guys, so this is how the situation is looking like. So we have a constant electric field E, which is parallel to this gap over here. So what's going to happen is each DQ charge on this ring is going to experience an electric force because of the electric field. And hence as a result, this ring is going to accelerate. Now for a second, let's just imagine if the ring was complete, that is, Q was present throughout the 2 pi r length, then what would happen is the net electric force in that case is simply going to be Q times E, where Q is the total charge, and the net torque about the center of mass is going to be zero. Because if you take a DQ charge over here, the force on it is going to be DQE. And if you take a symmetric DQ over here, the electric field for electric force here is going to be DQE, and their net torques about the CM cancels out, right? So if the ring was complete, the net force would be QE and the net torque would have been zero about the point O. The net force guys, uh, we can still figure out it's it's going to be QE only because uh, we can technically neglect this small amount of charge over here. But the net torque is not going to be zero anymore. And in order to figure out the net torque, I'm gonna imagine a full ring over here and because of this full ring we know that the net torque about the point O is zero and then I'm gonna add minus dq charge over here and we are going to add the contribution due to this minus dq charge because technically zero charge I can basically consider it as plus dq minus dq right this minus dq is going to be very easy to figure out it's its magnitude is going to be lambda multiplied by L uh, where L was given to be the length of the gap now it's also given that the electric force is parallel to this gap so so the electric force on this minus dq charge will be in this direction and its magnitude is going to be dq multiplied by e. So now we can clearly see that, th that there is going to be some um, torque about the point O which is going to turn this ring in the clockwise sense as viewed from above. So what's going to happen is this gap will start moving in the clockwise sense, right? So now if you observe something, let's consider the instant when the gap uh, turns by an angle of 90 degree with respect to the center O. Okay. In this case, what will happen is the, uh, the electric force dqe and the radial vector are parallel to each other and now it is going to have some angular velocity omega so it's going to mo start moving and the moment it crosses this bottommost point the torque is going to be counterclockwise and it will start decelerating so from theta equals 0 till theta equals 90 it is accelerating and from theta equals 90 till theta equals 180 it is decelerating. Okay guys, so now the thing is that torque is going to come uh, as some function of theta. Okay guys, so instead of dealing this problem by dynamics, we are simply going to use the work energy theorem because the work done by the electric force is going to be very easy to write as this is a constant force. So the work done is going to be the force, which is in this case dq times e and dq I'm going to write it as lambda L. So this is dq multiplied by e. So this is the electric force. Now guys, uh, now clearly this ring is going to accelerate and it will have some velocity v in the ground frame, but, but uh, taking the frame of reference as the ring center of mass, I can ignore the translational motion and just consider the rotational motion. So the work done by the electric field in this frame of reference is going to be dqe, the force multiplied by the times the displacement of the point of application in the direction of the force. So parallel to the force, the point of application displaced by a distance of r. So the work is going to be the force multiplied by r and this would be equal to the change in the rotational kinetic energy of the body which is half uh, icm for a ring it is mr squared times omega square and after solving the answer comes out to be qle upon pi m r square to the power 1 by 2. Okay guys, so now the, now the pseudo force minus ma, it will act at the center, right? And the center is not moving. So the work done by pseudo force in this case is zero. Okay guys, so now moving on to the next problem. So we have four identical particles A, B, C and D whose mass is m and the charge Q. They're connected by insulating light in extensible threads of length L to make a tetrahedron as shown in the figure. So uh, basically it's a regular tetrahedron. So each side length is going to be L. So now this thread AB over here is cut. Then we can kind of get a feel that uh, they're going to start moving. So basically we have to figure out the maximum speed acquired by every particle in the subsequent motion, okay? 
So let's figure this out. So this is how the initial situation is looking like. And now the thread AB over here is cut. So what's going to happen is initially guys, the net force, the net electric force was being balanced out by the tension forces. So now the issue is at A and B, the net force is not balanced anymore because one of the string tensions is zero. The point charges A and B are going to start accelerating. And hence as a result, the string tension is going to increase, right? Because there will be some centripetal acceleration required, right? For the motion of A. So the string tensions are going to increase and hence as a result, the charges C and D are also going to accelerate. So basically, if you consider this point as A, this point as B, and the C and D point to be lying along one single line, so you can kind of visualize this like a butterfly flapping its wings. So the acceleration of point A is going to be something like this, and similarly, B is also going to accelerate, and similarly, C and D are going to accelerate in the vertical direction. So basically, if you consider this situation over here, guys, where A, B, C, D all come in one single plane, so after this point, uh, they are going to, we can kind of get a feel that they are going to decelerate, right? And uh, by symmetry, we can see that uh, when the configuration achieves this state over here, it is going to come to rest. Okay, so this is exactly like a butterfly flapping its wings. So basically, A, B, C, D, all of them accelerate till this configuration. And afterwards, what will uh, what will happen is they'll start decelerating. So this is the configuration in which all of them simultaneously achieve the maximum speed as what they wanted us to find in the question. So now let's observe this view from the top. So, so from the top view, this is how the situation is going to look like. So now we can basically use energy conservation, just like we used in the previous question. So in the initial configuration, each charges were present at a distance of L from each other. Okay, and now for writing the initial potential energy, uh, due to the interaction of each of these point charges, as we have four charges over here, there will be four C2 combinations present, right? And you can count it. There'll be A, D, A, B, A, C, and etc. There will be four C2 such combinations. And as each of the charges are present at a distance of L, each of these contributions will have a magnitude of KQ square by L. So the initial potential energy of the configuration is four C2 times KQ square by L. And, and four C2 is nothing but six. So this becomes six KQ square by L. And uh, in the final configuration, which corresponds to this configuration over here. So let's just say the velocity of A is going to be into the plane. Symmetrically, we can see that the velocity of B is going to be into the plane. And as we discussed over here, CD will have a velocity opposite to A and B. So the velocities of, of C and D is going to be out of the plane, okay? So now how do we figure out their relative magnitude? So by symmetry, we can see that points A and B will have the same velocity and points C and D will have the same velocity. So, but how do we relate them? And the answer is as the net external force on the system is zero, we can conserve the momentum and the initial momentum is zero. So finally also it should be zero. And therefore all of them must have the same velocity of V. Only in that situation, the net momentum vector is going to be zero. So now let's figure out the final potential energy. So each of the string lengths are going to be L. So this angle is 60 degree. And with the help of geometry, we can figure out uh, this green length over here is going to be L root three. So uh, as you guys can see, the, the five of those interaction energies are still going to be same, but the only change is the interaction energy between A and B which changes because the distance changed, right? So the final interaction energy is going to be five KQ square by L plus KQ square divided by L root three, right? And the final kinetic energy is all of the four masses is going to have a velocity of V. So it's going to be four times half MV squared. And after solving this equation, you'll obtain the velocity to be this particular value. And this is the velocity V of each of these point charges in the maximum speed configuration. So that was it for this question. So now let's move on to the last question. Okay guys, so uh, in this question, two thin hemispherical shells that are made of insulating materials so there are no conduction concepts involved here so they are concentrically arranged in a free space as shown in the figure the radii of the larger and the smaller hemisphere are given and they carry a net charge of capital q and plus small q respectively the charges are uniformly distributed over the surfaces and we have to find the force of electrostatic interaction between the shells so they are going to repel each other mutually so we have to figure out that mutual repulsive force okay so this is the situation that is given to us uh, so the first thing uh, that we have to realize here is if i complete this sphere over here, the charge is going to be plus Q plus Q, which is plus two Q. So if I imagine a uniformly charged sphere, whose charge is plus two Q, in that particular case, writing the force is going to be, is going to be easy right? Because we can consider this full sphere as a point charge that is kept at the center and we can write down the force on it very easily. So now the electrostatic force of interaction on this point charge, let's call it F. Now, if you know the result for the electric field due to a hemispherical shell at its center of curvature, uh, it is actually sigma divided by four epsilon naught. If you directly know the result, then it's going to be sigma by four epsilon naught, which is the electric field times the charge, which is two Q. So 
and for those who don't know this result i would recommend re remembering it or what you can do is is to take the help of integration so let's say this angle is theta and we take a small patch on the hemispherical surface so this distance is going to be capital r so the electrostatic force on this patch is going to be k q divided by r squared k q by r squared which is the electric field at that point multiplied by the area of that patch uh, let's just call the area of this patch as da now guys so we know that the net force of interaction is going to be in the horizontal direction so we'll just integrate the cos theta component so so the net force is going to be the integral of df cos theta and this uh, integral breaks down as da cos theta and da cos theta is nothing but the projected area uh, of this hemispheric hemisphere in the vertical plane which just forms a circle whose radius is capital r so uh, there will be a sigma here as well sigma is nothing but the total charge on the hemisphere divided by its surface area and integral da cos theta would give you the answer as pi r squared and you'll get the answer as qq divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r squared which is exactly the same answer that, that we got from here as well. Now, so far what we have figured out is what is the net force on this big sphere over here? So we figured out it is equal to this particular value over here, which is F. We introduced this hemisphere with our imagination, right? So it's not present there in reality. So for that, we are actually going to introduce the other half of the bigger hemisphere. And the advantage of doing this is that now this forms a complete sphere. Inside a spherical conductor, the electric field is going to be zero. Okay, and now we are going to forget about this half that we introduced. Uh, and we are just going to focus on this hemisphere. So now if you observe something, the net force on this hemisphere is going to be zero right because it's placed inside the conductor and inside the conductor the field is zero if in this case it's certain that the net force is zero so let's name this big hemispheres as hemisphere one and hemisphere two so if the contribution due to one and two combined has to be zero right in the presence of just one if i say the force on this shell is capital f then the contribution due to two should also be f because only in this case the net force on this small hemisphere is going to be zero. So the interesting idea is that the force on this small hemisphere due to hemisphere number one and hemisphere number two are equal in magnitude. So F1 is exactly the same as F2. So basically the force of interaction in this configuration is the same as the force of interaction in this configuration is what I'm trying to say. Uh, so which basically means if I, if I bring back my other half of the inner hemisphere. Okay guys, so let's name these spheres uh, one, two and three. If you observe the configuration one, two, it is the same as this configuration over here. Uh, let's say the force on hemisphere two due, due to hemisphere one is F dash in the rightward direction. From our discussion over here, interaction between one and two is the same as the interaction between one and three. So the force of repulsion on three is also going to be same F dash. So basically on the full sphere, the net force of interaction is F dash plus F dash, which is two F dash. And two F dash is actually what we figured out above, which was QQ divided by four pi epsilon naught R squared. And from here, we obtain F dash as this particular value and the answer to a problem is itself f dash right because now if i get rid of this uh, fake hemisphere this f dash force of repulsion is what we were in search for and we have obtained that so basically we utilize symmetry in this situation uh, to our advantage so the, in fact there is a fun result over here even if this hemisphere right it was tilted by some angle theta so i'll draw it for you guys so even if it was like something like this basically it is tilted at some angle theta even in this case the force of repulsion will come out exactly the same and that is going to be an exercise for you guys right you can imagine a complete inner sphere and figure this out the interesting thing here is that this interaction force comes out to be independent of this angle theta so that was it for this video guys if you enjoyed the video please do like share and subscribe and that's it thanks for watching